My name is Sandra McCauley Thompson. I'm joining everyone from my home in Truro, Nova Scotia, but on behalf of Dalhousie University, thanks everyone for attending. So some of you have probably attended uh, an Engineers Nova Scotia Lunch and Learn online already. Uh, but for those of you who have or haven't, we're doing things a little bit differently. We've got a few extra presenters today. So I'm currently joined by Cliff Johnston, Doug Colburn, Colleen Rawlings, Phil Zink, and Corey Smith. So I think you should see all of our faces and I'm going to start and then I'll be handing the microphone over um, to uh, my colleagues throughout this presentation. We're hoping to keep the presentation about 30 to 40 minutes and, uh, and have some time for discussion and questions at the end. The other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, if anyone does have questions as we go, please uh, type them into the question and answer box over on uh, what is my left side of the screen and hopefully yours as well. Um, Colleen is going to keep an eye out for questions and I'll interrupt myself a couple of times uh, throughout the session just to see if we've got questions. All right, so thanks Colleen and thank you to Beth for doing all this coordinating and get us getting us up and running. We, um, we kind of pushed the boundaries of a typical lunch and learn online by asking to have so many presenters and she's been fabulous about helping us get set up. So without further ado, I've got to do a little clickeroo here on my navigation pan and pane and I think I can start. So our lunch and learn is uh, is titled Educating Engineers of the Future and you probably have realized by now that all of us work at Dalhousie with um, the mostly the senior engineering students who are going to be graduating each year and uh, so we're excited to tell you about the latest and greatest from the Faculty of Engineering at Dal. Um, I've got a short agenda here. We're going to talk about context first and, and hear from Cliff about the design chair that he holds at Dal Engineering. A little bit of details about the capstone program and the engineers in residence program of which we are a part and then what we also really want to talk about is our projects and um, why it's a great idea for all of uh, industry potential industry partners to consider sponsoring capstone projects um, this year and in the future um, but we've got quite a few uh, example projects that we also want to share that we think you'll find interesting to hear about um, as examples. So I'm going to hand things over to Cliff who's going to give us a little bit of context about his role. Cliff is uh, a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and also holds the NSERC Chair in Design Engineering. So I'll let him talk a little bit more about what that role means and looks like and how uh, how he's, he's pushed design forward over the last period of time at Dow. Okay, Cliff. And I'm not hearing from Cliff, but I did just uh, get a text from him that his computer just died. So sometimes Cliff likes to play jokes on me like this. It might not be a joke, um, but in this new virtual world, we're all flexible and ready for the challenges that each of these things present. So I'm going to just text him back and take five seconds to do that to say, don't worry, we'll cover for you until you're back. All right, everybody else good? A little thumbs up from my engineers and residents? <laughs> right on. So hopefully Cliff can come back and join us, but now I get to talk about him instead. Um, the, uh, the context for the design chair, and I'll, I'll do this quickly and then we can come backwards to let Cliff talk about it a little bit more. Um, but Cliff's role is, uh, is really to, um, the, the main goal of the design chair is to uh, look at 
undergraduate education in particular in engineering and how we can uh, insert even more design into that curriculum. Um, so my screen's now doing funny things and I'm only seeing my slides and nothing else. Oh, there we are, back again. So hopefully everyone can see can see these slides. We're going to come back to this when Cliff joins us and he can talk a little bit more about the work that he's done. Um, I'll just talk now about the Capstone program, which I know you're all excited to hear about. So in the context of engineering education and the broader design continuum that Cliff will tell us about, um, the Capstone program uh, is is uh, the culmination of students' engineering education. So many of you have probably heard about it before. It's the, it's the program where students work in teams uh, and we partner them with industry um, problems so that students have an opportunity to work on a, on a, a real world problem that comes from industry. Um, usually they're in teams of four. They usually have a faculty advisor assigned to each project and uh, the projects usually last a full eight months. So the final year that engineering students are in their diploma programs, uh, they are, or their Bachelor of Engineering programs, I should specify, they're working on their capstone programs um, and projects. Um, so we're going to talk quite a bit more. I'm going to just move on um, with, about some of the details of what those projects look like and how, how that match with industry looks. And I need to do a couple extra clicks here to get my navigation back. Um, so one of the uh, visions of Cliff when he began his design chair was to create a program of engineers in residence. And uh, we are really excited, all of us, to be a part of the program. Um, most of us work about a day a week in the Faculty of Engineering working with students. And this slide is a bit of a visual just to describe what our role looks like. So there's two main parts that I think about. The, uh, the piece on the left, the gray box on the left, is all about mentoring and coaching students, which we engineers and residents do, uh, particularly through the Capstone program. So it's mainly senior engineering students that we interact with. The other role for the engineers and residents is, um, is to develop and foster relationships with industry. So we look inward to the, to the faculty uh, to work with students, and then we look outward from the faculty to industry, and we see ourselves as kind of a bridging force to, uh, to connect industry with the university. Um, so my slides are going wonky on me again, too. I'm just rolling with this. Everybody else can see my slides okay? Yeah. Hi, Cliff, you're back. I am back. So exactly at the moment you said my name, my computer restarted. I have a lot of power that not everybody knows about. Um, so Cliff, I improvised <laughs> yes, a little bit. <laughs> I improvised a little bit. Appreciate uh, that. And talked, and talked about the engineers in residence, but I'm going to just flip back now and and we're sort of go in reverse for this part to just talk about the design chair and what that what that context is. Um, I've just briefly outline the engineers and residents so you can add a bit if you would like to. And then uh, the next thing on our agenda is to introduce each engineer and residents who's going to tell us about um, a capstone project from their discipline. So we're right on track. It's all good. Over to you, Cliff. Perfect. All right, thanks. Sorry. So um, the Insert Chairs in Design Engineering are a program that uh, has been around for about 20 years now. I'm in the in, in ninth or so year of my chair. Uh, they're generally 10 years um, and they were aimed at improving the design capabilities of our graduating uh, engineering students. And each, right now there's 12, 10 or 12 across Canada. There's been as many as 16 and there's probably been 35 over the 20 years. Um, but basically, basically we're, our aim is to improve design capability of our graduating engineering students. And each chair is different. Um, and each chair has a different uh, focus and, and flavor. So this is a, a slide that sort of gives a bit of the background on the chair that I hold and what we've been working on. And really it runs from, you know, sort of P to 12 outreach 
all the way to working with industry and public sector and community groups. Um, we've done some, you know, minimal work with P to 12 or P to 10, uh, sorry, where we are trying to do some uh, some mobile maker work. We actually have gotten some funding to do a build bus that we're going to take out to schools to sort of do show them about making and that side of engineering. We've run a program called Explore for young women who are interested in engineering in grade 11 or 12 who think it might be for them but aren't sure. And so then they're able to come and spend two weeks with us, um, basically do our first year design course and sort of get a better sense of what engineering is about and then, you know, if they were to come into engineering at Dow, they actually get credit for that first year class. Uh, so they have a little less of a load in that first term. Uh, we then focus really on our Bachelor of Engineering program, which is really the main focus of the chair. Uh, and trying to get what we call a design continuum. Other groups call it a design spine. But where we basically want a significant design experience for our students almost in every semester, but certainly in every year running from first to fourth year. And so over the last number of years, we've worked on our first year design class, which we've taken from being um, more CAD heavy to more design focused. And so now students come in and get a really good design experience in first year. Um, then in second year, uh, we have a second year design course, which we started early in the chair. So now students, before they would have first year and nothing till fourth year. Now they have a second year design course. Um, which is, again, a significant hands-on uh, design experience for all programs in engineering. Design three, actually, we have two programs now with a third year design course. Uh, industrial and electrical engineering have a design course in third year. Now we're working and we'll continue to work with other departments to try and uh, to get design courses in third year. And then, of course, we have our capstone program that exists already, and our engineers and residents are obviously a big part of that. So you can see the little EIR bubble that plugs into fourth year. Um, we also have proposed a, an interdisciplinary design stream, which would be another design capstone course that would be interdisciplinary, and students from any program could take. Um, and that's sort of been a lot of the work we've done. We've also introduced design into traditionally technical courses where students will have a small, say, a 10% design project as part of thermal fluids or strength materials or statics. So they would be taking that technical knowledge and applying it to a design and a design project in that course. So that way they would see design is not just separate, but as integrated with learning the technical. Um, we're also working on um, a master's program in design and innovation management. It's a collaborative program between engineering and business and uh, uh, NASCAD and design at NASCAD. So it will be more of a product design based master's program. And then we're also doing a lot of work with, with uh, in Nova Scotia, in the Maritimes, Atlantic Canada, around working with industry, our public sector and community. And so um, you can also see at the bottom then as, as part of all of these bits and pieces, we connect with lots of different groups, Department of Education, our Women in Science and Engineering, Adva um, Advanced Ed, Associated Universities, the sort of the entrepreneurial community in Nova Scotia, and uh, we have a sandbox that is also sort of connected in there. Um, and you see at the top, we also have the Amera Idea Hub, which is our new incubator for product-based companies that connects into a lot of this through outreach, but also through projects. We've done a number of capstone projects for startup companies that are housed in our Amera Idea Hub. So the idea was to just build this pipeline of design and building design um, expertise in our students across you know this whole continuum and uh, and we've we've been pretty successful I think um, our capstone program represents sort of that culmination for students uh, in engineering and it's taking all of the technical all of the design that they've done over the four years and trying to bring it to bear on an industry project um, so we match our students with with industry partners and I believe last year we had over 75% industry projects across the faculty. And these are real problems that industry brings to us that are back burner or something they haven't had time to get to or something they're thinking about but don't have the manpower to get to. Uh, and so our students work on it. Typically teams of four are assigned to each project and a faculty advisor works with those teams and they start in September and run to April. 
And then we have uh, our engineers and residents, which is a big part of the chair that I've held. And really, um, it, didn't, it wasn't a new idea. Other people have been doing this for a number of years. I'll just mention the three big things for me um, was really to support our capstone program and promotion of engineering. It was mentoring and it was fostering relationships with industry. So our engineers and residents are all people who have industry experience. They're not academics. They're boots on the ground engineers doing the work. And they bring that perspective to our students and to our faculty for that for that matter. So really, they're working with our students and in, in helping to mentor them, our faculty to you know connect us to reality sometimes. And then with industry and the community, to bring that to, you know, sort of use their connections to help connect us uh, and our students to those projects. And um, they also do a, a number of other things. Those are the core things. And one of the things they've done is over the last number of years has created our Dalhousie Engineering Capstone Conference, which we have is thousands of people at, and it's a huge celebration of the work our students have done. It's almost like the graduation from design. Um, but really, it's that mentoring and it's that fostering relationships that is a big part. And it has been a, a huge part of the chair and the work that we've done in building this design continuum. So I'm going to unmute myself. Thank you, Cliff. Um, what we'd like to do now is introduce each of our engineers and residents. And when we do that, um, I've We've found a bunch of uh, posters that will give examples from every discipline. We're going to start with Doug, um, who will just take two or three minutes to share with you a, a capstone project um, from, from that discipline. So Doug Colborn is our chemical engineering engineer in residence. And I'll hand it over to you, Doug. OK. Uh, thanks, Sandra. Um, you make that full screen? Or do I need to make that full screen? I think I can here. So. OK. Yeah, I, I've got it on full screen here, so uh, I can't see myself. So but anyway, hi. Um, yeah, my name is Doug Colburn, and I'm the uh, Dalhousie Chemical Engineering uh, Engineer in Residence. I'm a 1976 Cam-Eng grad of Dalhousie, or back then it was actually called Nova Scotia Technical College. I've spent the majority of my career in uh, process design, plan operations, project management, engineering management, and I've uh, mainly worked in, um, in natural gas, um, petrochemical, refining, carbon capture, and, and the oil sands industries. And I've also spent uh, five years at the University of Alberta. I was a uh, part-time sessional instructor in the chemical engineering capstone design course. So, so I worked on the capstone design course at U of A, and um, and then also now here at uh, here at Dalhousie. Um, my wife and I retired back to Nova Scotia last summer, and this is my second year as the chemical engineering EIR. And I very much enjoyed myself doing this. So, so what I'm going to do, um, can folks see the, um, the poster um, for full screen? You, you might want to go to full screen if you want to look at some of the details of it. Um, but I'm just going to very quickly go through, um, spend a few minutes going through uh, what was a uh, typical chemical engineering project from last year. And you can see on your screens, hopefully, uh, that this, uh, this project was a design of a cruise ship bilge, bilge water treatment facility. And as Cliff mentioned earlier, we typically have four member teams, and this was a, was a four member team. Uh, last year, we had 16 teams or 16 projects uh, in the chemical engineering faculty. And it looks like this year, we're probably going to have exactly the same number, uh, uh, 16 teams. So yes, we are still looking for projects. So I'm not going to go through a whole lot of detail. I'm just really going to give you an overview. And hopefully, this graphic can help, uh, help you see it a little bit better. 
one of the first things the group had to do with this project was um, determine what the design basis was. Now, the overall driver as the client presented it was um, the, the client saw a potential economic opportunity for treating bilge water in, in the HRM area from Halifax arriving cruise ships. Now, I'm not sure if you can really see, but there's a little map of Nova Scotia there. And um, currently, um, bilge water from any, any arriving cruise ship in Halifax it does have to be offloaded and treated. And uh, currently, the treatment facility uh, that's being used is in Cape Breton. The team really couldn't find um, much information about that. But that wasn't really part of the scope of their project. They were primarily tasked with um, uh, designing a bilge water treatment facility in the HRM area. So the first step was determining the design basis. So they had to look into the, uh, the history of um, cruise ship arrivals in, in Halifax. And you can see the little bar graph there showing the the various cruise ship arrivals over various numbers of years. Um, what the team didn't have was a quantity of bilge water and what the constituents of the bilge water were or are. And uh, so they had to do quite a bit of uh, research into that. And um, they came up with their design basis. Uh, they um, consulted quite a few references. And um, their design basis ended up being um, treatment of 27 million liters per year of bilge water. And you can see that, if, depending on if your eyes are good, under the design basis. So that was step one. They had to figure out, okay, what capacity do we need to treat? And that was a 27 million liters per year. And the next step was, okay, what's over what period of time, and they selected six months because that's a typical cruise ship season, which ended up being a treatment plant of about 163.5 cubic meters per day. The next step they had to do in the um, in the definition of the uh, well, the, the design basis definition was what are the contaminants in the bilge water and how clean do we need to get it? And again, they had to do a lot of research because that information was not readily available. And this isn't unusual for a project uh, where the students have to do a lot of research. So um, what the team ended up with, and a uh, little hard to see, but in table one in the bottom left there, um, they determined that the key parameters of interest were total oil and grease, uh, biochemical oxygen demand, uh, TSS, and then um, and then metals, um, yeah, the copper, copper, nickel, and zinc. And they uh, established their uh, their influent properties, what what the they had coming into the treatment process, and then they also had to determine okay what are our target values for the effluent from the treatment. And that required research too, because um, not a lot of that information was readily available. So they had to spend a bit of time uh, to determine that. So setting the design basis was, for this particular project was a big part of the work. And uh, for a lot of these projects, it's finding out what you need to do first is, is one of the keys. So what they did after they got the design basis um, nailed down, was to do quite a bit of research into various treatment alternatives. And I'm not going to go into the details on that, but you can see a little diagram there. That's the final treatment process that the team ended up with. And it's basically um, five treatment steps. Uh, it goes through filtration, gravity separation, um, solved air flotation, tertiary treatment with ultrafiltration. And then also the final step was disinfection uh, with ultraviolet. And so uh, from all the research and work that they did, this was the flow sheet that they came up with and um, met, uh, more than met all, all their criteria. There was one associated process involved with this and uh, 
and if you're looking at it in full screen, you might see it, but there's also a, there's sludge produced in this process, or sludge separated, and this process um, included sludge to, uh, to, uh, to basically uh, concentrate the sludge. So from the, the net outputs from this, uh, from this process, it's a, um, it's a light oil but that's skimmed off. It's a sludge product that requires to be disposed of. And then, uh, then a fully treated outfall that would uh, go back uh, into the heart. Uh, so that, this uh, was the, uh, after quite a bit of work, this was their, their, their final process selection. So what they did after they came up with the process design or process selection, they did a complete economic analysis. And so that included capital cost estimate, operating cost estimate, revenue estimate. And then from that, they did a complete discount, a, a DCF discounted cash flow analysis, and then uh, economic sensitivity analysis. And so out of all that, they came up with, uh, from this preliminary design, uh, a rate of return on investment of 22%. So that information aspect. That's great, Doug. Thank uh, you very much. Mentioned. Sorry, Doug. We're um, and we're losing your microphone. I think your volume is going down, and I think for the sake of time, we'll move on and oh. we can come back for questions afterwards, as well. Um, okay. Well, I was I was I was done anyway. So. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. So I'm continuing to learn as we go about uh, navigating my own screen here. So thanks everyone for continuing to be patient. Uh, Colleen's going to go next. Colleen Rawlings is from Civil Engineering and here is her project. Now I'm thinking maybe Colleen if we go full. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, Colleen Rawlings. I've been a uh, engineer in residence since 2017. Um, it's been a fantastic experience working part-time at Dalhousie um, with the design chair team. And so I'm currently paired with the civil department. I'm a civil engineer, structural by training uh, from Western University. Don't hold that against me. Uh, so I spent 22 years in the natural gas business, mostly in uh, Nova Scotia on the pipeline construction. And I recently started my own project management company uh, in Nova Scotia. So I've been working on several projects at the IWK and for other clients. Uh, so I really enjoy the part-time at Dow, partnering with my own uh, entrepreneurial pursuits. Uh, so today's project that I picked out um, was the Dalhousie Fitness Center edition. Um, and I just wanted to put in a plug for our, our web page as well. Um, if you want to look at uh, these posters in more detail or you want to look at uh, many of the other posters, if you go to our Capstone Conference page, um, on dal.ca, you can see all the posters. Um, this poster I picked was from 2019, actually. You can see um, the last uh, three or, or four years have been put up onto the website now if you want to look around at some other examples. So I picked this project. Um, it was a partnership between uh, the Dalhousie Facilities Department and CBCL Limited. Um, some of our projects do come from the various departments in, in Dalhousie. Um, so this was when, uh, some of you may remember, the Dalhousie Fitness Center edition was being built on So Street. So uh, often our civil projects are an existing building that may be under current construction or have been recently constructed. Uh, one of the um, intricacies of civil is finding a project that is suitable for the skills of fourth year students and that they can achieve in the two terms that they have available for the capstone course. So in this case, they were assigned uh, the Dalhousie Fitness Center and working with CBCL, the nice piece about having an existing project like this is that they're able to get all of the parameters from CBCL. So the industry client representative working from CBCL would have been able to provide the students with the loading assumptions as well as the soil bearing and any other details they need to work on their, their project. So uh, when we were looking for a design component for the students in this case, as much as um, it was already, the design was completed by CBCL for Dalhousie, the students would be sent back 
further into the design process and asked um, to determine whether it should be built with uh, wooden, wooden beams, structural steel, or concrete. Um, so this is identified on the, the left side of the, the poster. They're given their project scope and they're given the design process to go through. They would have had to look at the specifics of the project. In this case, um, there was some criteria to minimize the vibration and the noise. And so they looked at the, the various materials available and, and they did settle on structural steel along with some concrete elements to it. So once they've decided on their material, then they have available to them several uh, modeling software through the university. And so they then had to look at the deflection and the connection details. And they would take that their four years of university education and um, design, civil design, and come up with the final sizing of the elements and any rebar requirements in the structural and steel elements. And so, as you can see, they then were able to produce um, a graphic for it. They did the deflection analysis that shows uh, the concrete slab design and any of the steel elements. Once they were done the design, then they were able to complete a Class A cost estimate. Um, this is a good skill to have as they graduate and head into the workforce. So they would have provided a cost estimate on their final design, and they'd be able to compare that to um, any of the real-life data that CBCL could provide. So um, CBCL has provided us uh, projects, um, several projects over the last few years, so we really appreciate their support, and uh, we anticipate working with them again this year. Um, and it was really exciting for the students to work on the project and then actually see it come to fruition just down the street for them, so that's always exciting. Um, and I did just want to give a plug for civil. We're still on the hunt for some projects. We're trying to finalize our list for next year. Um, so if um, any of you have a civil project, you can drop us a note um, as well. We have the questions and answers chat on the side. So if you have any questions for us, um, I'm pretty sure Cliff pays me by the question and answer. So feel free to, to type a few questions in there and we'll try to answer them once we've gone through the various disciplines today. Thank you, Colleen. That was great. So we're going to move to uh, electrical and computer engineering and hear from Phil Zink next. Good afternoon, folks. Um, thanks for taking the time to, to join us. Um, briefly, my name is Phil Zink, graduated from Tech University of Nova Scotia in 1987, predecessor to the Technical College where, where I took. Attended in electrical. I worked in uh, Nova Scotia my entire career so far, working with local consulting. Currently working with the, the utility, and I had the pleasure of working with uh, Don Housie, uh, the local engineering department, in, in lecturing and doing some student mentoring prior to becoming an engineer in residence. But this is my second year now uh, in the engineer residence program. And so the project that I, I think a project is calling is set up the website from, from an earlier year. And this is kind of a neat, neat project in that um, a lot of the projects are, are is calling and dug it shared where <coughs> build something physical and the design and the process and all things we're used to. Um, this is more turned into a, a proof of concept design. So when, when a client comes with the project and say they want they want to want to want the sun, moon, and the stars, um, one of our jobs as engineers and residents is help the students, give them some mentoring and clues in terms of how to engage with the client to manage expectations. So is, these are two semester courses with other workloads, so they don't have all, all full-time full -time efforts to put them in these projects. So this project started, is it came out of the development field <clears throat> where in rural areas and other countries, installing uh, solar, solar energy and, and battery storage and trying to come up with a means of capturing and retaining data uh, that comes from these projects. As, as projects go and, and engineers come and go in these projects, sometimes information gets lost. So the concept of this project was to um, change the scroll. Um, it was to build a bit of a battery monitor uh, using the Internet of Things. Basically come up with an app um, with some interfaces that you can you know, monitor the, uh, the, uh, the system. Uh, the condition of the batteries <coughs> from a handheld device. So it, it required uh, incorporating some local storage. So they developed a microprocessor 
run with an SD card that would be local to the to the uh, facility that would capture data, and also had a link to a cloud-based server to capture the same data. Um, <coughs> incorporated a number of different uh, technologies in terms of how to capture the data. It was tested, I'll say synthetic, synthetically, it was tested, and you can see on the screen there, they came up with some, some app pages and some, uh, some uh, proof of concept results, which proved to be very promising. So future steps to come out of these types of projects um, include using different types of batteries, better synchronization of global data. Um, but they, they were able to actually able to achieve their project. So the part I guess one I want to highlight here is this is a very neat and novel project. It, it, an example of the diverse nature of some of the projects we get from our industry. But it also gives an example of how uh, the injury of business, how we how the students learn project management skills and client management skills to help manage expectations. We come up with a design and a project with a scope that is achievable. And in this case here, they are able to achieve the final scope that was agreed on with the client. Um, I can't comment where this went from here. This is a couple years old. Uh, but just a good example of, uh, of how they, they manage their time and come up with projects that fit their schedule and deliver a project that's of value to the, to the client and a great learning experience for the students as well. Um, that's it, uh, Sandra. Awesome. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, so next, we're going to move to mechanical engineering. And Corey Smith is going to share his project with us from mechanical. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining the Lunch and Learn today. I'm Corey Smith, mechanical engineering graduate of Dalhousie, or tons, uh, from 88. Um, I've had a career in mining and smelting and ship repair and fabrication and machining and 16 years ago I started my own consulting business and so I do machine design and some precision measuring like laser alignments. I've been with the engineers in Nova Scotia Dalhousie for this will be my third year and uh, I quite enjoy it. It's, it's, it's fun to spend time with the students and, and share my experience and hopefully help them out. So Sanders got the poster that I chose for a project from 2019 and it's <clears throat> from Fairchild which is a local manufacturer of children's outdoor clothing and she has, the entrepreneur who started Fairchild, has a cradle to cradle design philosophy and that the clothes are made from recycled material and when the kids uh, grow them, although the, the design part of it is that they um, they last the kids a long time uh, as they grow. But when they when they're done with the clothing, they can return it to Fairchild, and Fairchild will repurpose it the the clothing. So she one of the first things they need to do is remove the brass snaps from the clothing, and so she was doing it manually. I'm not sure all the details, but it was a very manual process. So she approached the capstone or Dahazi with the capstone project to get the mechanical engineers to make it more efficient to get rid of the brass snaps in the clothing. So the team of four um, took this on and they've you can see the uh, they defined the design requirements in the top right and the process is detailed there, one of the squares on the left. Um, and the design features of the machine itself, and that, of course, safety is a big concern. They have a guard to keep people's fingers out. They have an emergency stop button. Um, and the image is there in the center. There's the brass snap. Who knew brass snaps had four pieces? Uh, below that is the die. That and that they are the punch that they chose, which um, they chose one that's easily purchased for off the shelf from an iron worker. And there's an article of clothing there shown at the top right. And the bottom shows the machine itself. It's a tabletop machine. And that, I believe, is a 3D rendering of the machine, but the machine actually looks very much like that. 
And I think hats off to the technicians at the Dalhousie Machine Shop who built this. Uh, it was very well done and um, a very successful project in that the uh, at Fairchild they use it to, and they've increased their efficiency by quite a lot um, and it's and it's safe um, for the removal of the snaps and um, this was a great project it won a prize I believe in that in 2019 for one of the best projects and um, Mechanical usually has between 25 and 30 projects and it's the time of year that we're really hoping to gather, get those 25 or 30. So if anyone out there has a mechanical project, we'd love to hear from you. So you can contact us on our website or, and uh, so I think that's it. That's mechanical. Awesome, Corey. Thank you. Oh, I lost my control again. Uh, so I'm the last one up and I'm going to talk about industrial engineering, but just uh, before I start on that, you'll notice uh, as you've been listening to the presenters that we uh, we work really hard and we're proud of our students who um, by their final year have, have really figured out the design process and so the steps of that design process which are often iterative are, are often apparent in the projects and hopefully they are here too. So. Um, we're really proud of our students and what they can do when they get to final year. Um, this is the project that I'm going to present from industrial engineering. So um, I was also a graduate of TONS. I actually graduated in mechanical engineering and um, later did a master's degree in, in industrial engineering uh, because my work had involved manufacturing and operations uh, quite closely. So I've got a little bit of a diverse background, but uh, I'm enjoying representing industrial engineering now. And I usually start by uh, letting people know that industrial engineering is uh, not always well defined and well understood, but uh, industrial engineers look at all kinds of problems that have to do with making things more efficient, or better. Uh, so improvements to uh, scheduling, routing, other logistics challenges, um, optimization problems, and often inventory and database design as well. This is a really neat project that uh, was done a couple of years ago, the class graduating in 2018. The team was working with HRM, who every year, as you're probably aware, repaint the lines on all the roads in HRM, the white lines and the yellow lines. And for years they had a really skilled operator who planned out the summer work and decided what lines would be painted when. This team was uh, challenged with the task of replacing that operator who was due to retire by looking at the area that needed to be painted and developing a, a tool that could optimize uh, for cost and time, the, um, the the operating the operations for doing that repainting. So, uh, in the fashion of everything else, the students really spent some time on problem background, on defining the problem, um, and they were able to gather some good data from HRM and from um, ArcGIS for addresses and and road information and and travel distances. Uh, and this is a nice poster because there's a nice visual here that you can see what they what they did after a lot of data analysis and cleaning and and modeling is um, created a new set of routes. So each color is one day's worth or one shift's worth of um, repainting operation. They considered a lot of things, um, but mostly considered distance traveled, um, the m amount of time travel time when the truck would be painting versus not painting. Obviously not painting is wasted travel time. Uh, and they were even able to work in break time. And kind of a fun sidebar uh, note out of this project is that uh, as the teams were developing their solution, they decided to consider all the locations of Tim Hortons throughout HRM. And they were able to include that as a factor in their model so that many of these shifts were designed with a break um, such that the team or the, the truck team would be near a Tim Hortons for, uh, for their break. So 
the uh, end result uh, of the project was that they were able to reduce the number of shifts by 25 percent. So uh, on average, previous summers had taken 40 shifts of um, painting workers to complete this and they were able to create a schedule that used up about 30 shifts, I think. Uh, so it was it was a it was a fun you know very real world project that that the students could relate to and understand and they they had some really nice success there with HRM. So I want to just uh, talk about the real reason we're here, which is to persuade and convince everyone that that joining our program by bringing us projects is the right next thing to do. I see we have one question. Um, from Raymond regarding the capstone program are the students employed by the host company and who takes responsibility for their real world designs as they are not yet licensed great question thank you for that um, we'll talk about a few more details in a minute as well but I can answer that question by saying that our students are all um, operate on these projects as students of Dalhousie so they're very clearly student projects they're not employed by the company but we are they are engaged and we do have a capstone agreement that um, that covers issues of confidentiality intellectual property uh, which typically we uh, say is owned by the company so that um, companies do uh, own any IP that may be developed afterwards and in terms of the real world designs um, anything that's done and and someone else might be able to speak to this better, Colleen or someone else, um, in terms of designs that need a professional engineering stamp, those absolutely would have to go through either the faculty advisor or the um, professional engineer at the client company where, um, where they're working. I'll just pause for a moment there in case um, someone else from my team wants to just address that question in a little more detail. I can do that. Uh, that was a great uh, answer, Sandra. And part of our recruitment is we like to ask for sort of back burner um, issues with a company since it will take us until uh, April of 2021 to provide the next uh, bunch of solutions. And I just wanted to articulate, we're showing you the, the posters, which are basically a summary of the eight months of effort of the students. Um, the industry client gets like a full report as well, which is often sort of 40 plus pages with details in it. Um, but we do, uh, when we recruit projects, we indicate to the in industry clients that we are giving you uh, results based on uh, fourth year graduating students. They're giving it their best effort. Um, and in most cases, it allows you to progress an idea you may have had, but somebody within your company may have to take it and, and get it to a, a PNG or an actual approved design phase. But the intention is to get you much further down the path than you were. Yeah, thank you, Colleen. Um, so I'm looking at the clock and just realizing that we, we want to keep things moving along. So I'm going to quickly talk about this very important topic, which is why should industry get involved? We've discovered that there are a few really good reasons that, that um, companies should and that companies do choose to get involved. So this is in no particular order, but uh, through a lot of conversation with companies, we've learned that this is an awesome opportunity to, number one, explore the application of new technologies uh, with low cost and low risk. And sometimes that even means, as Colleen said, moving a design a little bit more forward or gathering more data about a problem that is still fuzzy or unclear for a company. Uh, number two, companies get to work with creative and energetic students. Often companies see this as an opportunity to potentially find uh, future employees that they that who will be looking for jobs at the end of their projects and so it's a nice um, screening process. There's another uh, benefit which is just to have that contact with Dalhousie. So drawing from faculty expertise which comes through the students but it's uh, for a lot of projects having that faculty advisor uh, can help the students really fine-tune and also access some of the labs and facilities that are available at Dalhousie as well as the expert researchers. Um, and lastly, and, and it, we, uh, 
we have loved to learn over time that this is actually one of the top reasons for a lot of um, companies to get involved is simply to provide that opportunity for students. Um, all of you were student engineers at one time and I'm certain that now at whatever point in your career you are, you realize how much you had to learn as a student and a lot of that learning comes from that hands-on um, open-ended problem situation and so we have a lot of really enthusiastic engineers and other members of industry who really want to support engineering students and help give a really good experience to them. Um, Again, typical projects are usually open-ended. We like back burner problems where if it gets to April and the project uh, timeline is finished, it's not going to be a deal breaker for the company if the results aren't exactly what was hoped for. Um, so important but not critical. Um, it's important for those of you who might think about in getting involved to consider that there is a little bit of time required from the client side. So some time uh, available from you or a colleague to give time to advise students on the projects is is worth thinking about ahead of a time um, as well as often especially in non-pandemic time site visits um, and then we have design review processes where stakeholders companies and students get together um, midway through the process to meet and discuss the design process um, and then interim and final presentations often take place and reports sometimes need to be reviewed. So there's a few pieces where um, clients do need to be prepared to be involved. Um, but fortunately, the costs are very minimal. Usually um, the costs range from zero to about $3,000 depending on the project and that, that's a little bit dependent on discipline and also just the nature of the project, whether materials are required for prototypes, um, software licensing, that type of thing. This is a great slide. I'm going to blow it up so you can have a quick five second view. We're really proud of all the um, project sponsors who have been involved year after year. And so this year, although we didn't get to have our annual capstone conference in person, we still created this poster just to recognize all of the project sponsors from this year. So Cliff mentioned um, 75 to 80% of our 120 capstone projects were came from industry and this is just a quick snapshot of some of those people who were involved with us so we thank them and any of you who uh, who may be a part of that um, poster okay my slide's gone funky again so I'm going to advance a couple quick questions about um, COVID-19 that you may have Dalhousie courses are going to be online this fall semester for sure, but we are still hoping to do as many industry-based projects as possible. Many of those projects will be done remotely, and so we're particularly seeking projects that can easily be done without being on-site um, and where companies are open to that or equipped to do uh, remote meetings um, uh, for students who are either not located here in Nova Scotia or simply to protect our students from the risk of COVID-19. We will also and we do also have an approval process for students to visit sites if a project requires that um, students be present to make observations or collect data. So we're kind of open for business as much as, as uh, clients want us to be and uh, there's a little extra communication required for some of those situations, but we're really hopeful that we will, um, we will still receive uh, lots of interest and in we have so far, but certainly always um, happy to hear more. Our, our deadlines are a little bit different from discipline to discipline, but generally um, by the middle to end of August, we like to have, have things lined up, so anytime at all. Um, that covers that slide. So, so that brings us to the end of our slides and I, we, uh, we just get so excited talking about these projects that we often take up more time than we, than we plan to. But there's a few more minutes for questions. Um, if anyone has any, please feel free to type them in the Q&A. Um, Colleen's doing an awesome job of plugging and promoting all of our avenues for for finding out more about capstone so thank you colleen there's a there's a link in the question and answer um, page that 
you can follow, which will take you to a place where there's more information, where all of our uh, email addresses are, and you can also view a lot of other posters if you're interested in just learning more about what a poster looks like, or sorry, a, pro a capstone project looks like. I'm going to stop. I'm going to encourage people to po post questions on that page, and I'm going to just throw it out to my colleagues in case someone else would like to add some more. And um, we do offer, if uh, anyone's, uh, if we've inspired most of you to have some uh, capstone projects for this fall, um, we're really uh, in the recruitment mode for the next week or so since this term's about to start. But uh, any of us is available to have um, a conference call or a telephone call if it helps you sort of hash out what a design project is you have, or if you're new to the idea, then any of us is available to uh, to work with your organization on a one-on-one -on -one basis as well. If you're in a real rush to get in touch with us, here are our email addresses below. Um, again, these are available on our website, so you can look there. So Mark, besides these capstone projects, are you able to elaborate more how DAL is supporting engineers in industry to meet their professional development goals and objectives? What technical classes opportunities are available to engineers in industry uh, that can help them upgrade their technical skills or establish, establish relationships with academics needed to enable them to enter graduate studies or upgrade their degree? That's a great question. Um, I suppose we could have a whole other session on that, couldn't we? And Cliff, maybe as, as our academic person, I'll ha pass this over to you. Um, I, 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 my quick answer is that this is a little dependent on the department, um, but, but that we don't, we don't really focus on that too much, although Idea Hub uh, might be an opportunity for people to connect, and we're always happy to kind of on an individual basis connect people with the resources that they need. Cliff, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's sort of two parts there, which is professional development. Um, I mean, there are there are a number, a large number of graduate classes that are available. Um, uh, there's an MEng program, so you could do a course-based master's uh, if you were interested in that. Uh, and then all the sort of the courses that you could take as part of that, you you could probably try and do one or two. Um, there probably are some courses through ConTed or continuing education at Dalhousie as well that would uh, align with the engineering uh, um, vein. Um, in terms of connecting you know, relations with academics for graduate studies and upgrading their degrees, that's a good question. I mean, I think there's a, you know, certainly just if you have an area of interest and you had them as a professor or if you didn't, going online and you can, you know, I think any of us will respond to a good email that's, that's sort of having a, has a question about grad school or about, uh, you know, potentially, you know, additional studies. Um, there's not particularly, I can't think of anything off the top of my head in terms of um, opportunities where industry and academics get together for discussing that. But I do know that, you know, Dalhousie has done a number of these um, professors from engineering have done some of these lunch and learns with ENS. Um, we have some of our own uh, seminar series as well as the Amera Idea Hub. Uh, the Amera Idea Hub has a seminar series that we started with um, this last year. Um, we also have a lot of speakers that come in, visiting professors will come in and give presentations that you know industry is invited to and welcome to attend as well. Um, we, you know, and then say contacting any one of the engineers and residents uh, and the Amera Idea Hub, uh, industry liaison and innovation office at Dalhousie, um, the faculty of engineering main office, <laughs> Any of those sort of contacts will will be able to help uh, direct you to the right people to talk to if you have specific questions. Um, and you're welcome to contact me. I mean, if I can't help, I will know may know someone or I may know someone who will tell me the right person to talk to, and I'm happy to do that as well. Okay. 
And we're always looking for people to give guest lectures in our classes. If, if that's a way you'd like to sort of step in and get involved too, you know, practicing engineers who can provide a little bit of time to provide some of that input to our students would also be really valuable. I think you're muted still, Sandra. Oh. I didn't think, I, am I muted now? You're good now. Oh, does that work now? Okay. You're good. Sometimes it can take more than one full session to <laughs> get this tech stuff working. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions. We're at 101. I'm happy to stay on for a minute or two longer in case people do have other questions. Do any of the other engineers and residents have anything they want to add? I'm seeing nodding heads. <laughs> um, thank you everyone for attending and uh, and listening. We hope our enthusiasm has been infectious and we would more than love to hear from any or all of you who are interested in more details or would like to, to join us in, in our uh, mission to help these new and future engineers develop even more experience through their capstone program. So thanks again to Beth and, and to Engineers Nova Scotia for this opportunity. I believe the recording will be posted later on YouTube so you can spread the news to all your friends that uh, there's, there's info on capstone available.